you'll note, we are videotaping this session. It will be available on our YouTube page and will be posted on our Facebook and website in its entirety. Now there is a reason why we ask that you not record. We provide this information to our community in its entirety because we don't want anything to be misconstrued or put out of place. If you have a cell phone, please silence it out of courtesy for everyone else who is in the room. And before I begin, let me tell you about the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan organization. By nonpartisan, I mean that we do not support or not support a particular candidate or political party. It does not mean that we do not have political views, but we are nonpartisan wholly. This is an opportunity for you to hear equally from both candidates for town supervisor. You will have an opportunity to submit questions that will be reviewed and vetted by the League of Women Voters for redundancy and other qualities. With that, I'd like to introduce you to the president of the Suffolk League of Women Voters, ILO, Lisa Scott, who will be moderating this event. And I would also like to extend the best of luck to our candidates and thank them for their attendance. I'm sorry, I guess I'm just not up to snuff. <laughs> um, Lisa has asked that we begin this session with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would everyone please stand? I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Colette, and uh, I'm very pleased and proud to be here to be asked to moderate this uh, candidates meeting debate tonight. Uh, just so you know, I do not reside in the town of Huntington, I, uh, so I will mispronounce names potentially, and because it's a primary, I did a few of these last week, and I once referred to a Democratic primary as a Republican primary, so, uh, you know, you make mistakes. <laughs> Uh, but again, um, I want to thank all of the people in the League of Women Voters of Huntington who are a very active league, really good people. If you're not familiar with what they do, please seek them out. They're wearing buttons. Uh, also, I'd like to uh, call out to Diane Slavin, who is the chair of their Voter Services Committee and also is doing the timing tonight. Diane, you just want to lift one of the cards so the candidates can see them too. And as far as I understand, um, everybody's agreed to a two-minute opening statement. Uh, I will ask the questions, we'll go back and forth. And all questions go to both candidates, but we'll take turns. So Ms. Edwards may get first, Mr. St. George then replies to the same one. Next question starts with Mr. St. George and then Ms. Edwards. And we'll go back and forth like that. We're also using what we call our red cards. Do you have records? Yes. Um, this is their opportunity to rebut. So even though each one has answered a question, if the person that went first feels that there's something more they want to add, they can ha raise that red card. They'll be allowed to do it four times, and you'll get 30 seconds again time. And if the other person also wants to rebut, so we'll have a four-way, we can keep going. Uh, they can do that. They also, at the end, will be allowed to make a closing statement, and we hope at that point they'll address some of the issues that they feel have not been appropriately dealt with 
um, from their perspective. Uh, we also, as you know, are getting questions from all of you. Uh, index cards are, were given out, I believe. And uh, if you need them, raise your hand. There are people in the audience who will do it. Um, they'll also then be collected. We have two individuals over here from the league who are vetting the questions. What that means is they're grouping them by topic because I can't possibly ask every single question. So what we want to do is cover every single topic that is relevant to the Office of Supervisor of the Town of Huntington and also um, is germane to this primary debate. Uh, we apologize if we miss any of your questions or there's a topic that we just don't get to in the hour and a half that we have. We have a hard close at 8.30 and that is including the time for the closing statement. So, um, all right, Mr. St. George will begin with his two minute opening statement. Yeah. All right, uh, good evening, my friends. Uh, I would like to thank the League of Women Voters for sponsoring this most important event, the South Huntington Library. Uh, Councilwoman Edwards for being here tonight. Uh, my supporters for really bringing us to this point, uh, as well as you, my fellow citizens, for being engaged and caring enough for coming out to this meeting. You know, this is a historic moment for our town. For the first time ever, there's going to be a Democratic primary for the town supervisors. For the first time in nearly a quarter of a century, our town is going to have a new leader. And many of you here tonight are going to participate in the Democratic process and vote for that individual and usher in a new era for the town. This is exciting. You know, what we see, I think, from the national level right on down to the local level, is that our country and community is at a crossroads and we as Americans are being tested. The question before us is, are we willing and prepared to fulfill our civic obligations and take part in the solutions? Now is the time for a new generation of leadership. My experiences, background, and commitment to democracy have more than adequately prepared me to lead our town in this unique moment. My time as a classroom teacher, working to motivate and inspire the students to get involved in the political process. My former student, Corey Ryan, is my campaign manager. My time in the Navy, working as a medic on the battlefields of Afghanistan, taking care of wounded Marines and Afghan people. Returning stateside and being tasked with the heavy administrative responsibility of overseeing the medical readiness for our entire battalion and then coming home with an honorable discharge, and returning as a civic leader, working with other civic groups and the town, identifying what I believe are the three key issues facing our town today, which is safety, the environment, and much needed democratic reform within the town government. And I look forward to talking to you more in depth about those issues as the night goes on. So thank you again for all of you coming out tonight. voters and all of you for coming tonight. I look forward to answering all of your questions and hearing about what's important to you uh, and your family. You know, I was uh, very grateful to be elected uh, in 2014 uh, as your council. And you know, three and a half years of government experience, I've really learned a lot. I've learned a lot about municipal government. I've learned a lot about what's working. I've learned a lot about what needs to change uh, to make it better for you and your families. I've also learned some of the things that we need help with with, the love, with other branches of government uh, to make our, our town stronger, 
safer, and better for you and generations to come. You know, it's, uh, I really truly want to thank Daryl because stepping up and running for a supervisor and running for any elected office, it is very difficult. And I want to thank you for the campaign that you have run because it is, you know, in this political environment, as Daryl has said, it's tough because you have outside forces that want to seek to divide our town. They want to name call, they want to distract, they want to make it about things that are just not about you and what's important to you and your families. Uh, I love working in the town. I love being your councilman. Uh, I want to use my experience uh, in government and also uh, my business acumen and also all of the things that I've learned uh, as an executive in a Fortune 500 company to make sure that we protect the assets for the town, protect your families, and to do everything that we can do to make it better. I was there when we had that certain tragedy uh, in Huntington Station. I was there for that family. I was there for the seniors who had scams run against them from outside forces trying to take their money. I was there for a stop sign that were really necessary to make the children safe. That's what people want. That's why I'm here. Thank you both for those introductory statements. Uh, at this point, I'm going to ask the audience to please refrain from applause until the very end. And then when the candidates make their closing statements, by all means, and cheer, and do whatever you want, but sit on your hands right now because it slows the proceedings down and we want to keep rolling. Uh, also, one other point about the questions. Um, when we say questions, we mean questions, not statements. So, um, that, which is unfortunately one of the reasons sometimes we only accept them on cards so that we can make sure we cover the topics that way. Uh, the candidates, I know, are available throughout the township. You know, certainly can meet and greet them at plenty of other occasions and hopefully get some more of your questions answered. So at this point, we'll start with, I am formal, is the words. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, the first question is... I'm sorry. Uh, first question. You've won the election. You walk into town hall. What's the first thing you're going to do? Well, you know, the town has millions of dollars of assets and a $190 million budget. You can, in one month, make a mistake that could put the town at risk and the taxpayers at risk. So the first thing that I would do is to make sure that I met with our assessor and all the controller to sit down and go over all of the finances, all of the fund balances, all the revenue that's coming to town. Because it is critical that you have a complete understanding about everything about the budget, everything about what is going out, everything that is about going in. So the first call that I would make is to the controller to ensure that everything that is in place is going to protect our town. Uh, that's important. It's, uh, it's critical. It involves all of the taxpayers, all of your hard-earned money in purchasing homes. You don't want to make a mistake. So that is the first thing that I would do. Thank you. Mr. St. George, same question. So I would certainly concur with Councilwoman Edwards. I, I, I think that that uh, is a priority and that's very important. But this is a, a very important election for a number of different reasons. Tracy and I are not the only ones running right now. There are two other seats that are up for town board. Uh, and as many of you know, Councilwoman uh, Berland is, is running for a seat uh, in the county legislature. So uh, should she win, and I expect she probably will win, I think she will win, uh, the, the town board will then appoint someone to fill her vacancy. So what I'm getting at is the dynamic of the town board will shift uh, depending on who is going to get elected in those two town board seats. And as a board member, the supervisor being a board member, you have to really be able to 
build consensus so that you can communicate your vision and translate that vision into action. Because you might be trying to do the right things when it comes to the budget, but if the people on the town board are not willing to work with you, it's going to be difficult to get things uh, done. So one of the first things I would do is sit down with those new board members and uh, try to come up with a plan. Okay. Thank you. Next question from the audience. What will you commit to regarding to regarding campaign finance reform? Will you agree in the general election not to take money from business and big developers? Uh, do you have any concerns? So, Mr. St. George, you can go first on this. Yes, in fact, that is part of a pledge that I've taken. I will not take any money uh, from developers. Uh, there are a number of towns in the state of New York that are experimenting with uh, campaign finance reform. I believe that we need to have campaign finance reform at every level. I think that Citizens United is one of the worst cases decided in the Supreme Court. Uh, I recently read a book by Zephyr Teachout called Corruption in America, and she talks about that case, but she also said there's more that we could do at the local level, and there are towns in the state that are doing this, and uh, I think that that's something that has to be a priority, because you know, when you have developers who have current or pending contracts making contributions to elected officials, it can really disrupt the process. And people can sometimes become beholden to special interests rather than the people, which is why I have committed not to take any money, uh, money from developers. And I would like to see that commitment and that pledge translated into legislation. Okay, thank you. Ms. So I think the only way that that can work is that everybody uh, and I would be willing to do that too if everybody does it. Because one of the towns that experimented on it was in Greenberg, New York. And what they did is have campaign finance reform, really strong ethics campaign finance reform, but it only applied to the incumbents. It didn't apply to the candidates. So in this case, I would have the campaign finance reform, you would not, and neither would Chad. So I think in order to really make it work, the goal is you have to make it easier to run for office. You have to follow the ethics law. You have to make sure that you have other income so that you are not beholden to anybody and you're making decisions based on what's good for the constituency. So the New York campaign finance reform needs to change. It needs to make it easier. It's not lost on me that it's been very difficult for you to raise money as a candidate. It's not good, it does have to change. But what I think it needs to do, it needs to change for everybody, it needs to change for all parties, minor parties, Thank everyone, you. every political party. Thank you. Uh, further along that line, that question was about developers. One of the things I'm hearing in various debates that I've been moderating is using the words pay to play. Uh, can each of you talk a little bit about the role contractors play in the town of Huntington and the relationship with the board, basically? And is that a concern? Is there a way to harness things? Uh, just give the audience some insight. Yeah, I mean, pay, pay to play is corruption. That's what pay to play is. There's no other word for pay to play but corruption. And if you are corrupt, you need to go to jail. It's, and we've had examples of that in every political party, even on Long Island. So if anyone is, so you know, you shouldn't call it anything else but that. That's what it is. So if you are accepting money, or taking a bribe, or getting some income uh, for a contractor that you do business with, then you should go to jail. It's that simple. Wait till the end. <laughs> I, I completely agree with Councilwoman Edwards. Uh, and this is a problem that we're seeing, uh, you know, not only in our town, but in many towns throughout Long Island and across the state and across the country. So Councilwoman and Ed Edwards and I both agree that this is a problem, and we both agree that everybody is doing it. So since we agree it's a problem, I think that we have to come together and, and find a solution. I know that there's not going to be a perfect solution, but the current status quo cannot continue. Because at this point right now, at every level, not only in our own town, the special interests are getting better representation than the people. And, and that's wrong, and, and I'm looking to fight that. It's not just a question of uh, my ability to raise money. It's also, for me, it's, it's a question of my conscience. I, I just, I don't feel okay taking money 
from uh, big developers. Can I use my card? Yes, please. 30 seconds. So, I have a clean conscience because I vote for some projects and I don't vote for some projects. And if you are in this for campaign finance to make sure that you are representing who gives you $250 or representing someone who gives you $1,000, then you shouldn't be running for office because that's not what you're there for. You have to follow the rules. You have to follow the state rules. You have to follow the ethics rules but you also have to have some morals of your own. And that's why you have good elected officials, and that's why you have bad elected officials. It's not that complicated. Okay. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to the question I asked, because there was a part of it that neither of you actually answered. So I want to ask, rephrase it, because I perhaps wasn't clear. And uh, Ms. Edwards, this will you first. Okay. Um, how do contracts work in the town of Huntington. When, when, the Hun when Huntington Township uh, decides to use a contractor, what is the process, the bidding, and are there waivers or exemptions that you can work your way around these types of things? Well, there's two ways. There's an RFP that you have to put out a request for proposal, and you have to accept the best qualified, lowest bidder, but there's also professional services that you can hire firms uh, that may not have the qualifications uh, for an RFP. However, they have the qualifications for the state of New York. You may find that their work in other towns and other municipalities has been exceptional. So you can have a performance contract uh, that is for a two-year period, and you can also um, renew that annually. But but the lion's share of municipal government is based on RFPs. Thank you. Mr. St. George, same question? Look, again, for me, it, it's very simple. When you have developers who have interests and have business with the town and they're making contributions, it's difficult for me not to see them making those contributions without expecting something in return. So, you know, this is a complex problem. I'm not going to argue that. I'm not going to say that there's any easy solutions. But I think that what we have to do is we need to make sure that it's easier for people to understand where the money is coming from. Uh, and it is public record, but we've got to make it more easy for people and accessible for people to see where the contributions are coming from. And if, in fact, those contributions are coming from developers who have business with town government and if elected officials are taking those contributions. And uh, again, New York State does have sunlight laws, so uh, it's relatively easy for anyone to go on the state database and find out who's been contributing to anyone's campaign. Um, next question from the audience, Mr. St. George. Uh, as a senior and a Huntington Township resident, um, and I take advantage of many of the programs in Huntington Township for seniors. What do you see as the future of these programs if you're elected? Well, I think that we have a lot of incredible programs uh, that the town is offering for seniors, and I think that we need to continue with those programs and certainly uh, look for ways to expand them. Um, I know that uh, my grandparents, uh, who are approaching their 90s, um, are two people that I have a tremendous amount of love and affection for, and uh, partly living in Huntington is something that uh, is very important to them. You know, they raised their family here, and I want them to be able to not only feel like they can stay here, but that they have things that they can uh, take part in. And the programs that the town offers and the senior center uh, are really a special part of the town. Um, and, and I'm glad that we have those things. I mean, I'm not going to criticize anything on that end. I think that uh, the town does really well there, and I think that uh, you know we need to continue with some of those services for seniors. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you, because I am at the Senior Center on a monthly basis. You know, the seniors contribute so much to our town. Uh, I um, started a program for seniors, uh, just an annual luncheon to get together a reunion for seniors that are over 75 that have lived in the town for more than 50 years. Uh, in the first year, it was 125, uh, and coming up this October, we're up to 450. 
Uh, so that is, it's a, it's a wonderful contribution that they have made and it's a very small thank you to everything that they have done. Uh, we have to make sure that we keep the beach club, we have to improve the senior center because it needs to expand because they are using those services for many programs, computer programs, uh, exercise, and we need to make sure that there's ample room. But we also have to help the seniors who are not coming out to be able to afford to stay in their homes because it is harder and harder for them financially. Uh, we do have services in the town where we come in and try to rehab uh, their homes, uh, but we need to do more. Thank you. Okay, Mr. St. George. Yeah, right. I think I answered You did. It was about your grandparents. <laughs> um, now let's let's go further into the senior situation. Um, obviously, there are more and more people who want to age in place in Huntington. Uh, Mr. St. George, uh, no, Ms. Edwards, you'll take this one first. Um, what do you think uh, the biggest challenge that the town can do something about in order to make it uh, possible? for people that age in place in Well, I think we have to do a couple of things. I mean, we have Promenade Village, uh, which is a senior uh, living, but we don't have enough because a lot of the senior housing that is being developed right now, you want, the seniors want to be able to sell their home, go purchase a condo uh, in one of the senior livings and put some money in the bank. But currently, all of the senior housing they are selling their home, they have to go to the bank and take out money uh, to purchase it. So we have to do more to create income, lower income, middle income for seniors. Uh, we also have to help that they want to stay in their home. They just want to be able to have, there are a lot of seniors that come to the Opportunity Resource Center just looking for a part-time job. You know, it is tough for them all around. Uh, so we have to provide more opportunities for a lot of the businesses that we have in town that will hire seniors on a part-time basis so that they can not only get out of the house, but they are helping uh, with their income. We also have to do a good job at managing the budget because the better we do at that, the better it is going to be for them to stay in their homes. Thank you. Mr. St. George. Yeah, so the truth of the matter is it is difficult for seniors to not only stay in Huntington, but to stay on Long Island. This is, again, a problem that's not only affecting our town, but the regional area. Uh, and certainly seniors are not the only ones who are having a difficult time staying in the town and staying uh, on Long Island. Uh, you know, I'm part of the millennial population. Um, and certainly we hear a lot of talk about that, about young people, keeping young people in the town, making sure that seniors are able to age in place. We recognize that this is an issue, it's a significant issue. But I think what's also important while having this conversation is not to immediately uh, assume that there is one silver bullet that's going to solve this problem. And what I've seen is that very often people will talk about we need to build more. If we keep building, that's what's going to keep the young people in Huntington. If we keep building, that's what's going to allow the seniors to be able to age in place. And I'm very concerned about that. I don't think that that's necessarily the silver bullet. I don't think there is a silver bullet, and I think that that creates problems in and of itself. Okay, thank you. Um, which anticipates the next question, uh, Mr. St. George. From the audience, how would, and can I ask you both again just to try to get oh, really yeah. close to the mics? <laughs> Um, Mr. St. George, how will you slow down development and there's concern about its impact on water quality? Yes, so is, it, is that better? Yeah. 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 Um, certainly, development, building, uh, it creates a number of issues when you have overdevelopment. Uh, water is a big concern. There are a number of other concerns. Um, you know, I think that one of the important things that we need to do is we need to take a pause. We need to pause. You know, there's this word uh, that a lot of people, I think, have misunderstood, this idea of a moratorium. What this moratorium, this pause means is we need to step back for a second and reflect. What does the master plan say? What are we really doing? What are we building? All right, and is it really providing affordable housing? Is it really helping the seniors stay here? Is it really helping the millennials coming in? And I think that the answer is no. I think everybody would agree with that. 
So we have to, that's why the pause is so important because if we continue with this trend, we're just gonna keep building and Huntington has already been built out. So I think the first thing we need to do is just pause. And then we have to come together, we have to have a conversation with members of the board, as well as a number of the committees within town and the people that represent the Thank town, you. civic groups, civic organizations, so on and so forth. Thank you. So, I don't agree that we need to pause. I think we need to do things differently. And if you read the fine details in the moratorium, it says in the fine print that we're going to keep the development on the average of what the acre is. So what that means is, if you're going to build affordable housing for millennials, for seniors, for first time, first time home buyers, build it over there, build it over there. That's what the fine print of the moratorium reads. And I believe that that is against fair housing laws. So I think that we need to be very careful before we enact a moratorium. Rebuttal? Yes, I would like to respond to that. I, I certainly hear Tracy's concern. The history of Huntington has shown that this has been a problem. 1978, Matinicock, and that was the case that inspired what happened in Yonkers. And here we are uh, over 30 years later, and that land still has not been developed. Uh, Avalon Bay was built in Huntington Station when the percentage of the people that live in Huntington Station versus the amount of affordable housing that's being built in Huntington Station is completely lopsided. So this is a problem that just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. That's why the, the pause is so necessary. We need to pause and we need to say to ourselves, what are we doing and how can we fix the problem? Because continuing to do what we're doing is not solving anything. Insanity is repeating the same behavior and expecting different results. Thank you. We're stay on this question. Yeah. <laughs> Your turn. You know, we have to make sure we take a look at how we got here also. Because we're talking about, as an example, Huntington Station. Let's revitalize Huntington Station. You know, Urban Renewal took all of the businesses, all of the apartments, and they are now parking lots. So if we're gonna pause, that means we're not gonna complete the revitalization of Huntington Station. That we're not gonna do anything in Melbourne. So that's what pause means. Pause means stop. And we have lived this already. So I am not in favor of a moratorium. I am Thank not. Do, uh, do I hear another rebuttal? I, I, I want to use my rebuttal, but I'm trying to be conservative. All right. I, I'm going to stop Don't take that the wrong way. I'm a progressive. Yeah. We, we tell them they can have four rebuttals. Do I hear an increase in the number of rebuttals? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because this is exactly, you know, yeah. yeah, let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, we want to differentiate, but we also want to drill down into the issues. So um, at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll double your All right. All right. All right. Come on, here we go. But I am keeping track. Okay. okay. Uh, so wait, how many rebuttals do I this have? This is your second, Ms. Edwards has used two as well. Okay. Um, well, look, the truth of the matter is there is a difference between a stop and there's a difference between a pause. And this is not a stop. I'm not looking to stop. Look, you know, Councilwoman Edwards is right. Uh, I believe that we're both running very positive campaigns. Unfortunately, there are people out there that are throwing some negativity into the mix. Yes, And they people are. have been accusing me of being against affordable housing. That's absurd. Affordable housing was created for people like me. I'm a veteran. Coming back from World War II, the veterans were being provided with affordable housing. I am a millennial. It's silly to say that I'm against affordable housing. What I'm against is overdevelopment, and this is a trend that has started for decades, and it's getting worse and worse. Huntington is built out. I mean, where, where, where else are we going to build? We've got to pause, and let's come up with a plan. But what you signed was a moratorium, which is not pause. It's stop. Moratorium it does not the mean detail, stop. The detail says you have to build any high-density housing would only be and an average of what the zone is. So it means stop or build it over there. That, that can I respond now? I, I don't know. Okay. If you respond now, you're even, and then I'm gonna stop. Okay, this my one. last response. Uh, 
this, going back to the negativity. From what I understand, there are, and I talked about this with the Huntington Township Housing Coalition. My campaign manager and I went and met. I felt like it was a little bit like the lion's den because, you know, there was definitely was some tension, but I think we had a good meeting. But what I found is there are multiple pledges circulating out there. So, and I didn't sign anything. What I agreed to was a moratorium, plain and simple. A moratorium, a pause, let's pause, let's step back, let's look at the master plan. I'm not saying stop. I'm not saying stop. I'm not saying stop. All right, I think what we want to do, get that? All right, and it'll come back in your uh, wrap-up later. Um, but I think, in speaking for the, the people here, that's one subject, the, the fine print and, and what it means. You know, the 900 Pandarella is what do people do who want to stay in Huntington or move back and they can't find a place to live. So I think we need to come back and revisit that. And also, you did make reference, and I won't inject too much into this, but to World War II veterans. And, you know, the segregation that occurred on Long Island occurred as a result of World War II and those housing loans, mortgages not going to veterans of color. And, uh, you know, so Huntington is a marvelously diverse community, yet from the outside I see, you know, there are still lines, there are inconsistencies. So can we start talking about housing, but let's address it from a couple of different perspectives. So um, I think Ms. Edwards is to your turn first. But if we talk about affordable housing now, um, in terms of diversity, not age, but diverse uh, possible current residents who need to move into a different kind of housing because they can't afford where they are. Um, are you, can you comment on any ideas you have that might open the doors a little further? Yeah, and I believe that I started that. Because the legislation that I sponsored with Councilwoman Berlin says that any Thing that you do new, 20% has to be affordable. And you know, the term affordable is difficult, right? Because you take the ones in the village, you know, the they're $3,000 a month or more. That's not affordable. So if you're looking at the 80% of the income, 80% of $3,000 is still not affordable. So what we did is say it had to be 80% of the Nassau, Suffolk, HUD market rate. That is more than half of a reduction. So you're talking about 1,500, 1,200. That is what would be affordable for people. You have to create multiple opportunities for housing, multiple. Because there, if you do not do that, you're going to end up where we are today. You have people living very high, high mortgages, and you don't have anyone, first time home buyers, you will not be able to do that. So you have to have create rental houses, okay. first time home buyers, Thank millennials, you. and senior houses. That's what we have to do. And that you cannot do with a moratorium. Okay. <laughs> All right, Ms. Edwards and, and Mr. St. George, you finish your phrase, please don't add no comments. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. St. George, same question. Okay, I'm not too sure what the question the is. The question but... related to affordable housing, but in the prism of diversity. Not age, but diversity. Well, I, you know, I think that when you talk about diversity, I think that age should be a factor. Um, you know, one of the things I'm very proud about in my campaign is we have an incredibly diverse group of people that are working on it. We have young people, we have old people, we have religious people, we have non-religious, well, seniors. <laughs> and we have a lot of diversity in our campaign, and I think that especially in our community and the nation, we have to really look at diversity from that perspective. The truth of the matter is, Councilwoman Edwards and I both agree that affordable housing is a serious issue in our town, and it's not being provided. Where I think we disagree is how we're gonna solve that problem. My perspective is that we're not gonna solve it by continuing to build with overdevelopment. And again, to be clear, the moratorium is not a permanent stop, it is a pause. <laughs> And we'll pause on this particular train of thought, and I think we'll move to another topic. Uh, again, both of you, please speak directly into the yeah, mic. Okay? 
Uh, so we're going to, in this one, we're going to go with uh, Mr. St. George. Uh, let's switch over to environmental issues. One of the biggest challenges in Huntington right now, and as supervisor, how would, what would you address and how? Well, you know, I feel like we keep coming back to this issue, but uh, I think one of the greatest uh, environmental problems that's affecting our community right now uh, has to do, and it's not just unique to Huntington, it's happening all over Long Island, is, is water, water quality. Um, you know, how many times do we see the beach closings? Um, and, and why is that happening? You know, the storm runoff, uh, the, the rising levels of nitrogen and, and bacteria in our water, and that's the result of a number of different factors. It's not the result of just one factor, it's the result of many factors. But what the experts will tell you, and I've had a series of town halls on this issue, and I've talked with many of them, but what they will tell you is one of the most important factors, once again, we come back to it, has to do with overdevelopment. And County Executive Ballone is talking about this. All of the officials are talking about this. And this is not just unique to Huntington, but as supervisor, it's one of the reasons why I'm going to call for the moratorium, the pause, <laughs> so that we can, you know, really take the environment into consideration with future development projects. Ms. Edwards? But that's not going to solve the current issue that we have. It's not an accident that the governor was here today talking about water quality, making sure that we are doing something, because we are trying to solve issues that have been going on for 60 years or more that have never been addressed. Daryl is right. Development is part of it. It's pesticides. It's fertilizer. There are a lot of other factors that you, ha you have to be very aggressive, and our town is very aggressive on environmental issues, on sustainability, on renewable energy. It's not an accident that he was here today in Huntington because we want to do everything possible. I'm a breast cancer survivor. I understand about the environment and the impacts of what it causes in cancer and the fear of families. It's tough stuff. And we have to do everything possible in order to do that, and we are. Can we do more? Yes. Will we do more? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. I have a number of questions, and Ms. Edwards will go back to you. Um, parking. Village of Everybody's favorite. Yes. <laughs> Give us your thoughts. It's always an issue. What can be done? At this point? You know, it is such a tough issue because now that we have committed to build the parking garage, then now are, there are people who don't want us to build the parking garage. We have to build a parking garage. We have to. But what I think we can do though is we can build one that is has a lot of greenery, that is aesthetically pleasing, that is the best that we can do in the state. I actually talked to the governor about it because he has to build municipal parking lots in the town and I gave him the model of what we have to do. We have to do better with building brick and mortar municipal parking. However, the other thing that we had to do, which we did by enacting legislation, is to ensure that any building that's going on in the village now, when you are developing, you have to have a parking lot. You have to have in-site parking or you have to rent space so that you can park because we have used the municipal parking lots over and over and over and over again. You cannot keep using the municipal parking lots. We have to do okay. a better job, but we Thank have you. to build a parking lot. Must. Thank you. Mr. Singh. So I'm not going to argue with the parking garage, but my frustration and certainly what I've been hearing as I go out to the community and campus and talk with people is why we need the parking garage. And once again, we come back to overdevelopment. Um, this is what's creating the traffic, the congestion, uh, and the lack of parking. Corey and I, my campaign manager, uh, were out canvassing uh, businesses in the village and um, we went into a, a deli and we talked with one of the deli owners and he was just completely furious, just saying how he's been losing business because people are just saying to themselves, I, I can't, I, can't, I don't want to have to deal with the headache of not being able to find a spot 
you know, I'm not coming into the village anymore. And I've heard that from countless people. So the parking garage is needed. But once again, we come back to the question of why. How did we get to this point? Let's talk about why. <laughs> because in 1999, and then again in 2005, we, the town board at that time, created apartments over the stores because the stores were suffering, because there were vacancies, because no one was coming into the village. So the problem that we have here is because it's built on our success. And we do have to do something about it. But that's how we got here. We got here because they needed help. So now, is it time to do something else? Absolutely. But we can't forget the history of why we created those apartments over the stores in the first place. It was to help that deli owner. It was to help the businesses that are there. So, Yes, do we have to do something about it? Absolutely. But again, stopping, we would have wiped out that area. <laughs> All right, folks. Mr. St. George, rebuttal. I get it. Wait, how many rebuttals do I have left? <laughs> <laughs> Is this not going to lead me to two? Is this going to lead me down to two now? I'm trying to keep track. This is your third. All right, this is my third, so that means I have two left. I got one more left. You can have one. No, no. All right, I'll, I'll hold off, I'll hold off. No, no, come on. I told you I would double them, you have eight. Okay. <laughs> Finish the thought, so we can move on. Again, you know, it, if that's why it was built, if it was built to help people, the people I'm talking to, it didn't help them. They're frustrated, they're hangry, and they're hurting because of it. So, you know, I, I again, and it's not a stop, it's a pause. <laughs> okay. Um, crystal ball, Mr. Uh, St. George. 20 years from now, what's downtown Huntington going to look like? Well, I can tell you what I would not want it to look like is, you know, just completely congested and, and, and four-story buildings. And I know, you know, people are getting very nervous about different projects that are being talked about and plastic galleries and I don't want that. I honestly, 20 years from now, what is it going to look like? You know, I have my issues, but ultimately, if I could, if we could preserve it and keep it the way it is now, I, I would be pretty happy. You know, I mean, there definitely would be some changes, but overall, I would like to try to preserve it as it is. I do not want to see more and more building happening. Um, that that you know, that's a reoccurring theme in this meeting. I think we have to do something with the waterfront. I think that that would be fantastic for us to uh, make sure that we are preserving it, but sprucing it up a lot. Uh, I think that what we should be doing is creating sustainable transportation. Uh, and you know, it's not just about the village. We have a huge town. We have going from the village all the way up past the train station to Jericho Turnpike. We need to revitalize that area. We need to make sure that we are putting it back the way it was, which was vibrant. It's not just about the village. We have 203,000 residents, hamlets all over this town. They need help. We need to help them. That's what governing is. That's what we need to do. And we need to make sure that you have that look and feel, not just in the village, but all the way up New York Avenue. That's what we need to do. And a pause is not gonna do that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from the audience that relates to where we're going on this, which is, um, there are a lot of hamlets, there are many, many civic associations. How does the Huntington Town Government interact and get feedback in general, from the residents in the township, in all these different jurisdictional areas. <coughs> so, I can only speak for me personally. There are 30 civic and homeowners associations that we meet a couple of times. Uh, we've also had Civic Saturdays where we're going into the community and meeting with the civic association. We absolutely can do more. 
But another part of the pledge, which I am not going to be for, is to allow a one or two civic associations to create the civic advisory board. Civic advisory and civic associations and homeowners associations are in each neighborhood in our town and they should have an equal voice on what is going on and not have to sign up to belong to a certain civic association in order to be represented. They are people, families in those communities, volunteers that are trying to better their community. They don't want to be run, they want to be, have a voice, they want to be vocal. I meet with them inside their neighborhoods and at town hall, and I will continue to do that. Okay, thank you, Mr. St. George. So again, this is another aspect of the pledge that I think there's a lot of confusion surrounding, so I feel I have to clarify. The civics advisory board that I've agreed to is not just one or two civic associations, and in fact, it's not called a civics association advisory board, it's a civics advisory board. And my vision for the civics advisory board is that you would have the major civic associations participating within this body, but not just the civic associations. You would have groups that represent the diversity that is in our town, like for instance, the HSLQ, the Huntington Station Latin Quarter. You have eight school districts in the town of Huntington. I would like to see, ideally, a board member from each of those school districts, if not a board member, an official from one of those school districts, represented on the Civics Advisory Board and would have a presence on the Civics Advisory Board. And then you can start coordinating with the school districts, which I've already started to do in addressing the drug problem. And that leads to a lot of other things that we could get done. The Civics Advisory Board, again, would be a vehicle to get people involved in the political process, which a lot of people feel like they've not been able to do, and it would not just be confined to two civic associations. We have to be clear on what I stand for. I'm not going to talk about a pledge that I didn't agree to. I'm talking about the pledge okay. that the okay. Civics Advisory Board <coughs> says it's going to be created by the United Civics. And I don't agree with that. Civic associations and homeowners associations have an equal voice. They should not be run. They're in all of our communities, all across the town, and I think that they want it to stay that way. They want to have an equal voice. They don't want to be able to have to join up to a specific civic association. There's 30 of them. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, we have a number of questions about government in the town. Uh, Mr. St. George, this is you. Um, please explain the town supervisor's role and compare it to what the town board's role is, the town council's role. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, ultimately, there are differences between the board members and the supervisor. The board members are part-time, uh, the supervisor is a full-time position, the salary is different, but the supervisor is just another board member at the end of the day. And it's important to acknowledge that, and that goes back to something I was saying earlier in the meeting. And the reason why that's important and significant is, is what I call the Butterfield effect. Ken Butterfield was a supervisor, I'm sure a number of you remember him. He was a Democrat supervisor, uh, and he had uh, a board that was, I think there were three Republicans on the board. And because they were able to form a block, it was very difficult for him to get things done. So. What really makes the supervisor different from the other board members? And in my view, it's very simple. The supervisor is a leader. The supervisor has to have a vision, has to communicate it clearly, has to be able to translate it into action, and you do that by building consensus on the town board and within the community. That's where the Civics Advisory Board, not Civic Association Advisory Board, comes into play, and you get things done. Thank you. Ms. Edward? The supervisor as a town board member is only one aspect of the supervisor's job. Darrell is correct. He is a town board member and he has one vote. But he or she, <laughs> he or she also is the town's fiscal officer, also has 14 departments that they have to manage. They're also part of a governing body of Long Island. The supervisor is the CEO of the town. OK, 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Do you favor councilmanic districts, and why or why not? Ms. Edwards? You know, it's, uh, that's an interesting question, because when I was first in the NAACP, I was for councilmanic districts. But I will tell you that I am dead against it now. And the reason why I'm dead against it now is because we are living the result of councilmanic districts in our Congress. Because Congress only cares now about the constituency that is going to vote for them and not for the public at large. And that is what we would end up with if we had council medic seats in Huntington. We would have board members representing certain areas and that's the only people that they would care about and they would not care about what is happening and they would not be accountable to all of the residents in the town. So when councilmatic seats was put in place before, it was to create minority districts and try to make sure that we were going to have representation. It, we are way away from Thank that you. now. Thank you. Mr. St. George, councilmatic. Yeah, so I, I think I'm inclined to agree with Councilwoman Edwards on uh, this particular issue, but what I recognize is why there is a desire for something like councilmatic districts and really it gets to the idea that there are people that feel certain parts of the town are not necessarily being represented and they feel that if there were councilmatic districts that those board members would then be more accountable to those specific parts of the town. So I understand where that, that feeling comes from and you know, to me the best way that we respond to that issue if people feel that they're not necessarily being represented uh, by the town board is with the Civics Advisory Board. Thank you. I ran out of cards. <laughs> I'm not giving you any of mine. You got me on that one because I ran out of cards. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. okay, but let's move on. Um, Mr. St. George, you, uh, uh, you first. So what's the first thing you're going to do in office about youth? All right, well, I'll be in office. <laughs> I, I think that that's... Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I'm 35, baby. I'm not, you know, I'm 35. I, Rick Schaefer, who's the county chair, uh, Democratic county chair of Suffolk, I just found this out the other day. I don't, I don't know if Councilwoman Evers knew this, but he was 28 when he was elected to be the town supervisor for Babylon. Um, I don't think that you can underestimate the power of having a young person in an elected office. Oh. I think that it really... I'm, gonna get well, I'm, the, I mean, I, I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> my campaign has been all about getting young people involved in the political process. My campaign manager is a former uh, student, and I'm very proud to say today was the first day of school, and a young lady in one of my classes came up to me. I didn't say anything in class, but she saw my signs, and she said at the end of class, Mr. St. George, I'd like to get involved. And I said, well, i got to call your mom. i got to make sure it's okay with her. But she's sitting over there with her dad right now, and it's just its incredible. It's a real inspiration. Thanks, Emma. Thank you. Uh, Are you finished? Yes. <laughs> You're, uh, I am a proud 55-year-old breast cancer. <laughs> and I have 35-year-old children. <laughs> I have... 11-year-old grandson and a 5-year-old granddaughter. And I am running for supervisor to represent your families, your kids, your generation. And I am committed to getting everybody involved. But you do not have to be 35 in order to be an effective supervisor. Okay. Okay. Um, now we'll get to the question I asked. <laughs> Which was the softball. <laughs> the question was about uh, getting young people. Wait, Sorry. No, no, no. I'm going to go back in reverse order. Ms. Edwards, you first. You walk in the door, you're the supervisor. Issues. What does the youth of Huntington need? 
Yes, there are younger people in the audience, but by and large, seniors come out to vote. We need to hear about what matters for young people in the township. Well, there are many things. So we have a youth bureau for Huntington. Uh, and one of the things that Daryl and I actually worked on together is the drug addiction and recovery. We have to have a robust, robust program to make sure that we are helping families and doing everything that we can to help young people. We also need to partner with all of our school districts to ensure what can we do better in order to help them. I also think that we can, for young people that are graduating from college, we have wonderful businesses, small businesses, large businesses, that we can create opportunities and economic development so that when they graduate, they are coming home with a job. Thank you. Mr. St. George. You know, one of my great political heroes is uh, President John F. Kennedy, and uh, one of the great lines, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I think in that simple message, that's the key to getting young people involved. They want to feel empowered. They want to feel as if they matter. Uh, they want to feel as if they have a say uh, and that they're, they're making a difference. Uh, and I think there are a lot of different things that we can do to help cultivate that kind of culture because it's sorely needed. You know, young people are very turned off by politics and we've got to address that because it's about the future of the country. And the Youth Bureau is an ideal vehicle to do that. Working with the eight school districts, as Councilwoman Edwards had mentioned, I've already started doing that. Three years ago, I brought the school districts to address the drug problem. That's another way you get young people involved. You talk to them about problems that they're directly affected by. You know, I lost my brother. He would have been 27 on September 4th. The other day, he would have been 27. I lost him to an overdose. And, uh, you know, this is a terrible epidemic that's taking far too many people, period, but it's especially affecting young people. And uh, there's more we got to do about that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. St. George, what's your feeling about term limits? I'm in favor of them. I don't, you know, I can I feel it, it, it ties in actually to the previous question. Um, the current supervisor has been in power for 24 years. Uh, in Smithtown, you have Vecchio, who's been there for, I think, almost 30 years, probably more. And then you had Saladino, who was, was it, or Vendito, Vendito, who was arrested, and he was there, I think, for like 20 years. I think term limits are absolutely necessary for a couple of reasons. One, it allows for more people to get involved in the political process. If the same people keep getting reelected over and over again, you know, talk about young people, that's a big turnoff for young people. It's like, you know, how am I gonna break into this? How am I gonna get involved? Same people get elected over and over again. And term limits is just a piece to addressing this problem of trying to enfranchise people and get people more involved in the political process. But it's an absolutely necessary step to getting people more involved. I'm open to the idea of three terms, which would equal out to 12 years, which is what the county legislature currently is. But where the county gets it wrong, in my opinion, is the terms are two years. That's far too short. You get elected, and then you've got to worry about getting run, uh, running for re-election. I prefer two, but I would accept three, which would equal out to uh, 12 years and keep the terms at four years. Okay, thank you. So you actually agree with me. Ms. Edwards, your uh, turn. Councilman Cook came to me because he was in favor of two four-year terms. And we talked about it for months. Because what I said to him is, while I applaud the fact that he reached out to the community, only 51 people actually completed the survey and said that they wanted term limits for two four-year terms. So what I said to him is when he proposed the two four-year terms, I amended the resolution so that it would be consistent with the county and it would be three four-year terms. Uh, term limits is what people want. Uh, I think we have examples of good government where people who have been in office for longer than eight years, longer than 12 years, but we also have elected officials who have been voted out in the first term. Uh, voters know what they want to do but I think it does provide a process to get more people involved. So I would be in favor of three four-year terms 
I did vote for three four-year terms, and the vote went down. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from the audience, uh, which I will read. It's a little long, but I, it, it's not about affordable housing. It's not about housing or moratoriums. It's about business development. Uh, and uh, Ms. Edwards, you will start with this. The Route 110 corridor was at one time designated a high-tech and finance center for Long Island. Much of that area sits within the town of Huntington. In recent years, we've seen more businesses leaving than coming to this corridor. The quad is virtually empty, high-paying jobs have moved away. What's your position and do you have any plans for the future of the corridor? Well, I've already started because what I want to make sure is that we understand the business needs for the people that are currently there because whoever asked that question is absolutely right. If we do not do something there, that what we will do is end up with a corridor worth of nothing because all of those businesses will go elsewhere. I'm not in favor of giving them tax breaks because the school districts really cannot afford to do that. But we can give them other incentives in order to make sure that they are staying. We have to provide forecasting for jobs so that we can help them have good employment that are there. Uh, we have to redevelop it because those buildings have been there for years and years and years. We have great opportunity there because we have the Farmingdale College, it's close to transportation. Uh, in terms of the Long Island Expressway, uh, we we had we had no choice but to do something in the Melville Corridor. Otherwise, uh, the Half Hollow School District is going to suffer, the Farmingdale School District is going to suffer, and those businesses are going to fold. Thank you, Mr. So, you know, I certainly would agree with Councilwoman Edwards that that is an area where there is a lot of opportunity, uh, and I would agree that. Uh, getting the business leaders together and talking about a plan of how we can take advantage of those opportunities is absolutely essential. But once again, I see here how this provides an opportunity for the value of the Civics Advisory Board. Because the Civics Advisory Board, as I had said earlier, is not just made up of civic associations. Although you would want the civic associations to weigh in and, and be involved with this, particularly those that exist in that particular area. Because I have canvassed in that area and I've talked to people who live in that area and you know they have some pretty strong opinions about what will be going on in the corridor. But the school districts being a part of the uh, Civics Advisory Board could also provide input and talk about uh, ideas that we could explore in terms of building uh, in the corridor and uh, looking to uh, do some really good and creative things there. It's definitely, there, there are opportunities there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. St. George, starting with you, um, if you're a supervisor, what would you do about opportunities for people with disabilities in jobs, housing, and transportation? So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I'm uh, very passionate about. We have an event on Saturday and we have Mikey Brannigan. I don't know how many of you guys know Mikey Brannigan, but he's an incredible young man. Um, and uh, he's going to be speaking at our event, and uh, we have a number of people who've been joining our campaign. This is a central issue for them. Just canvassing the other day, uh, I had spoken to a woman afflicted with a disability, and um, you know, what I've gathered from working with these people on the campaign and talking with individuals where this is something that's really uh, affecting their families and themselves is that uh, there's definitely. Uh, things that uh, we could be doing to, to help them and uh, you know I'm open to their ideas and what it is that uh, they feel the town could be doing more to assist them because that's an important part of the population and I want to make sure that we're taking care of them. We already have a citizens advisory board for the disability and they bring ideas all the time in terms of what we can do better for youth, what we can do better for seniors, you know, I will tell you that one of the things, going back to the village, uh, one of the things they shared with me is that when you're in the village and you have a wheelchair, sometimes they have to go all the way around the block in order to find a way to go off of the sidewalk because of the way new development, there is a requirement in order to make sure that it is handicap accessible 
but if the building was there for a long period of time, we did not have that requirement. So we have to make sure that we are marrying those issues so that they can go off and go on where they can. That's very frustrating. We have to create more youth programs. I'm so proud that I created with the help of the uh, Suffolk County and also the Walt Whitman High School that we have youth programs on Thank Fridays you. that are totally dedicated to children with special needs. Okay. Very important. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions that are actually more relevant to federal issues, but there is a clear effect on the population in the town of Huntington, and if either of you become a supervisor, you're still going to be facing these. So, Ms. Edwards, starting with you, um, there's a question that brings up immigration, and of course, uh, with the President's uh, punting DACA over the Congress with a shall we say, unlikely solution in six months. Um, is there anything that the town can do to protect its residents who might be vulnerable to deportation? What's your stand on these issues? And uh, what are the challenges involved to a Huntington elected official? So one of the initiatives uh, that I am most proud of uh, as councilwoman is the Opportunity Resource Center, where one of the programs that we have there currently is immigration rights. So that we can make sure that all of our residents know what their rights are. You know, the action that was taken by the president was heartless. It was, it was heartless. And we have young people that are in our community, that are doing wonderful. And they are living in fear now. Their families are living in fear. And I will do everything possible as supervisor of the town of Huntington to work with them to make sure that they understand their rights and to lobby as hard as I can to ensure that that is cared for. We have Congress people and they need to act very quickly to solve that issue. Okay, thank you. Mr. St. George? So, uh, this really is a very upsetting issue, and uh, it's an issue that I'm confronted with on a daily basis as a teacher in the town, uh, and I work with a number of students that uh, would be directly affected by this. So, the first thing that I do as a teacher is to just to provide comfort and let uh, those who have unfortunately been targeted by this, let them know that uh, you know, I'm here for them in any way that I can help them. Um, you know, we have to really, unfortunately in a local position, we are really, we're limited in what we can do to address this, but we're not powerless. And I think the most thing we need to do is give people hope. Let them know that we are there for them let them know that we are going to protect the most vulnerable parts of our population uh, and, and logistically work as best we can with Second Precinct to try to make sure that people aren't being targeted and try to work within the schools and the school districts and the Youth Bureau um, because uh, it's very unfortunate what's happening in our country right now and it's, it's a forgetting of our history. We are a nation of immigrants. We need to remember our history and we need to do more to protect those people even if it's not uh, within the federal government uh, is purview. Thank you. Mr. St. George, uh, the second federal issue that definitely has an effect within the community is the, uh, at least of the present, the strangulation of the Affordable Care Act. And uh, combined with long-term care plans being pulled, and have the plug pulled on them, uh, again, it's not a town uh, responsibility yet at the end of the day if there are more sick people in the town who can't get health care it ultimately has effect, an effect on the quality of life in the town. Can so, you comment? so because we're getting into some of these federal issues and we're getting into some of these state issues one of the top priorities for me as supervisor would be to create a healthy pipeline that starts at town government and works its way up into the state legislature. Uh, our current congressman is a Democrat, Tom Swazi, who I helped 
uh, when he was running in his primary, and then I helped him in the general running against Jack Martins. But we have four state representatives. One of them is looking to run against either Tracy or I, and we're going to do everything we can to defeat him, right, Tracy? Yes, <laughs> and you have three others, Rhea, Marcelino, and Flanagan, all Republicans. What I'm getting at is the next town supervisor has to make sure we have a healthy pipeline where we are running good, legitimate, Democratic candidates who are going to challenge those people so we can fight for the right things in the state legislature and Congress. It starts at the local level. This is what Bernie Sanders said, and we got to take it right on up. And that's what I intend on doing. Um, I'm going to lose the question if you interrupt. So are you, are you finished? Oh, time's I up. thought I ran out of time. Yep. Okay. So Ms. Edwards, please. I really want to answer this question as a role of the town supervisor because I believe that that is really important. Um, there are grants that we can apply for in order to bring more funding to make sure that we are partnering with Northwell and Huntington Hospital specifically to create programs for our residents. Uh, one of the things that I was so proud to do uh, is to partner with Huntington Hospital after I was diagnosed with breast cancer to find out what are things that women need to know. I had a fabulous surgeon. I had a fabulous oncologist. I asked a lot of questions and I wanted to make sure that I took that information back to share with residents. There are a lot of things that we can do to ensure that we are bringing all of the information back to our residents to ensure that they are living the best healthy life as we can. And we are lobbying our state and federal officials for resource, resources and grants in order to help at the town level for our residents. Thank you. Um, Ms. Edwards, this one starts with you. Uh, from the audience, uh, it states that there hasn't been a reassessment of property in, uh, it says, in 75 years. Do you favor a reassessment so that homes that are underassessed will pay their fair share? And you can expand that into a larger discussion of homeowners and property taxes. I even know who asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you that I do not think that we should reassess. I think we have to do everything possible to try to have shared services. We have to partner with all of the municipalities and the school districts to create opportunities so that we are not increasing taxes. But I think if we start doing that, that goes to a very slippery slope. I'm not in favor. Thank you. Mr. Sager? Yeah, so I would agree with Councilwoman Edwards. I think that, uh, you know, in terms of how we address these issues, uh, we have to be very creative. Uh, shared services is something I'm a strong supporter of. Uh, Governor Cuomo has been talking about this, and he's tasked the county executives to work with the local governments and municipalities. And I think there are a lot of opportunities there. When you talk about the eight school districts, um, having them work together and coordinate can not only help in terms of taxes and economic burdens, but it can also lead to collaboration uh, and coordination, and it can lead to really meaningful results with issues that are affecting all of the school districts, and it goes back to the drug problem. This is something that I've already started. I mean, the heroin opioid epidemic is not just affecting Northport High School, it's affecting Walt Whitman High School, it's affecting Cold Spring Harbor High School. So we need to come together to address this problem. And in coming together, we become more effective, but we can also get a lot of added benefits out of that. So shared services is just one of the ways of achieving that goal. Um, and uh, I'm very interested in, in looking at others as well. Thank you. All right. We have, I think, one more question and then we'll go to the close. Uh, we'll come back to money. So, uh, Mr. St. George. There are two questions. One is a general one. What are the financial challenges facing the town of Huntington and what would you, how would you resolve these? And then someone else said, but what's your most important issue for the 2019 budget? 
Okay, uh, so two two part question. Um, the first part of the question, I think, look, you know, economically, we talk a lot about a triple A bond rating. That's really important. We have to acknowledge that. We also have a growing debt. Uh, we talk about uh, how in the last budget, which was 190 million dollars, uh, there was a vote to pierce the cap. My concern is if we continue to go down those roads economically, that could start to hurt us. So I think that shared services is one way that we can start to perhaps potentially make improvements within the budget because you know when you're talking about taxes your school taxes are higher than your town taxes and a lot of people are very confused about that so shared services participatory budgeting is another area that i'm really interested in administrative modernization i mean when when uh, supervisor patrol was first elected these didn't exist so, you know, now they do exist, and I'm sure there are opportunities technologically for us to make improvements, and that can help us budget-wise. Um, so, and meeting with those department directors that Councilwoman Edwards was talking about, and talking with them, they know better than the supervisor. Tell us, what are you spending your money on? How can we use a scalpel to, you know, address some areas that maybe uh, could use improvements and create greater efficiency? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. So we have, $178 million in revenue that comes in, which is not enough. We have to make sure that we are bringing in more revenue that's not just the tax dollar. We do have a $190 million budget. We do have $334 million in capital assets that we have to uh, protect. Uh, that AAA bond rating does mean a lot because it gives us the ability to have road infrastructure and acquisition of parks and making sure that we have the finances in order to have fund reserves for a rainy day. So managing the budget and the fiscal responsibility is critical and I am confident because I did do this job every day I managed the $220 million budget every quarter. I had the best financial results in the state of New York. I had the best customer service results in the country. I am prepared Thank to you. do this job. Thank you. Um, each candidate will have two minutes for a wrap up and we're actually, uh, since Mr. St. George started first, Ms. Edwards will finish. So Mr. St. George, would you do please do your closing I'm statement? Sorry, first again? Yep. Um, no, I'll go first. Thank, thank you. Yeah, no, I, uh, this is an incredible experience. It is a great honor to be running with the woman sitting next to me uh, in this primary. I am very proud of the fact that this is the first Democratic primary in our town's history. I'm a little sad, too. I wish it had happened sooner, but I'm glad that it is happening. And that is really the result of people getting involved in the political process. And I believe that that's what has to happen at every level. I am an optimist. I believe that our town has a great future ahead of it. But I also believe that we have very serious problems facing us. I believe that the heroin opioid epidemic, the gang issue, which we didn't even talk about tonight, um, the environment, which we talked about, these are real problems. And I believe that the only way we're gonna really resolve them is by getting people involved in the political process. That is what my campaign has been all about, and that is what I will be as a supervisor. Yes, I will be a leader, but the way that I will lead is by bringing people together, whether that's the Civics Advisory Board, or that's other entities that we're gonna to create together. Collectively, we will make decisions, and we will get things done, and we will continue to take the town in a direction that's going to benefit all. So thank you so much. It has been a tremendous honor. And uh, you know, you are living proof of what this is all about. People coming out and getting involved. We need to have more events like this. So again, thank you all. Thank you. I am really excited to be here. I've lived in this town my whole life. My father was a Huntington police officer before they went to Suffolk County. My mother was a community activist and still is uh, right in this town. My first volunteer experience was a candy striper in Huntington Hospital. I love this town. I'm not going anywhere. My children were raised here. 
my grandchildren will be raised here. I am prepared to serve you. I am prepared to serve you. I've been a school board member. I've been a civic leader. I am a civil rights still activist. But I am a retired business leader. And that's what you need. You have to have a business leader in order to run this town effectively. I'm proud to be here with Dow. I have nothing but good things to say about him. I want him to be my partner. But I will tell you that I believe very strongly that I am the best qualified person to be the town supervisor. And I thank you very much for your time. Tuesday, September 12th, is the primary election, and please make sure you go, and any of your neighbors, uh, do happen to know. And I am so impressed with both of you. I appreciate your exchange. I appreciate your... <laughs>